All right, quick, quick uh, introduction and thank yous to uh, first to MTech. Um, I'm a part-time instructor here. Um, that's kind of how they run the, uh, the web development program and probably the mobile development program too. I'm not so familiar with that. There's a QA program now that just started and they're uh, having a related meetup upstairs tonight. Thanks to them, we double booked and he let us <laughs> come in here. I, I got here first and he was nice to, to let us let us stay. But um but MTech, they've got so many programs. It's over a hundred programs, trade programs from welding to plumbing to mechanics to uh nursing to medical uh transcribing to uh, dental assisting to uh cosmetology, uh food culinary. Um uh, let me see. Yeah, so tons of programs. Um, anyone can take them. They're they're uh, subsidized and directed by the state of Utah to fill the needs of physicians here in Utah. So it's uh, very very good programs. Anyways, I um, they a big part of what they do uh, is high school concurrent enrollment programs. So if you know. Uh, kids in high school, talk to them about, see if they have an M-Tech nearby and find out what programs are available to them. Because like when they're a junior or a senior, they can do release time and spend half a day at M-Tech and uh, come out with a trade certificate at the end of a normal school year. Most of their programs are eight months. And uh, I mean, if you get into like nursing CNA, then and I think they're, that's two blocks uh, of eight months. And then, then you still have to take the state boards and that, all that. But um, um, great, great programs, uh, great opportunities. Um, yeah, trade school versus a university. A lot of people overwhelmed by the uh, opportunities and the time commitment for a university degree. Um, but yeah, they've they've allowed us to come in free of charge and and uh, come and use this this great conference room. So many thanks to them. And thanks to Ionic, um, they uh, provide the food. And uh, yeah, great group of people. They come to town for NG Comp, which is the Angular Conference in Salt Lake, um, and other conferences too, React Comp and, and some others. And uh, got to meet and hang around with them several times over the years. And uh, just great group of people, great product. That's why I uh, host this meetup. Uh, have a good time working with it. And uh, same with uh, Brett and Corey, we're the three main co-hosts. And um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to mention there for that? <clears throat> let's see if anybody's on YouTube. I saw a couple people said they were waiting. Uh, oh, there's, there's some comments here. Corey's incredible. Yes, he is. Links to the resources. Um, we will. We'll provide links. Um, let me see and see. I could pop that up and boom, shows right out there. Yeah, we'll get that. Uh, we'll get that. Get all the resources. We'll put them here on the meetup site. So um, I don't think StreamYard has a chat feature or do. Yeah, looks like they do actually a comment feature. So let me. I'll drop this one because it's kind of the starting point for most of the content that we pass out here. And we'll, so there, there's, uh, it's kind of funky, but there's two ways to chat here on a meetup. There are comments and there's event chat. I don't know why there's two, but I try to, in fact, this one's got a comment on here. I haven't read. Um, Coming late, save some food for me. All right, is Julius here already? No, still, okay. Corey's running late too. He he missed the train, but we don't have him start until seven, so he'll, he's fine. He'll get here before that. Um, yeah, so that's what we're planning for today is uh, we've got, got some dinner going and uh, there's there's cookies over there and then there's we've got a bunch of, there's, there's a few Ionic stickers and pens left. I'm, Trying to get some t-shirts and socks and hats and cool stuff swag from them so hopefully one of the next few meetups will will have some of that but um then there's just a whole bunch of random fun stuff if you like to put stuff on your laptop or hang from your bag 
uh, just ask you to take one keychain. Um, just, uh, yeah, I don't want you to take a whole bunch, give them to your friends and stuff. But um, a little bit more about me. Uh, now, let me see. Well, I, I work full time. Well, now let's let's make this officially part of the introductions and stand up part. We did this last time, which was two months ago, and it worked really well. So, once you kind of prepare, don't don't stress or sweat over it. But we want you to come up here so that you can stand in front of the camera, just briefly, and watch out for the cords. We got cords all over. But um, just come up. Introduce yourself, what you like to do, why you're here, and and then maybe do a, a, a stand-up type uh, report. What, what have you been working on lately? What uh, what are you going to be working on? Like, what are your what are your short-term goals? And if if you're stuck if you if you're stuck on something, the other third part of a of a scrum stand-up, you can also mention that too, because we'll we'll have time after to to collaborate and. Uh, yeah, try to answer questions. So <clears throat> about me, I'll, I'll start, and then if we could just just uh, start front to back and get everyone filed through. Try to take you can take anywhere from thirty seconds to maybe three minutes, and uh, you're welcome to even pull up in the browser. We've had a couple of people demo something real briefly, but keep it to like three minutes if you would uh, of, of stuff that they were working on. And uh, welcome, Corey. Good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, just starting the introduction stand-up part. So again, I'm Todd Hale. Full-time, I'm a developer for Verisk, which I've been there for 23 years. And for 22 of that, we were exactware. And uh, we've officially, we were bought out over 10 years ago by Verisk. Um, we've officially made the, the formal switch. Don't use Exactware anymore. Use Verisk. <laughs> so uh, work, we work in the insurance property claims industry. From So if you, if you have damage at your home that you need someone to come in and fix, you call your insurance company. They come out. They assess it. They send in the contractors, do all the work and all that. That whole process is managed with our software. And about... 90% of the insurance companies in the US and the contractors that work for them, you know, uh, they have a, a professional relationship to, to serve, they use our software. So we've got a, a great uh, a corner on that market for now. And we're working hard to, to keep that. Like I said, it's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, about 30 to 35 year old company but uh, started in down in Orem, and and uh, now our our main building is right next to Ancestry, just a mile east of here, straight down the highway. Um, great company. They, they don't hire a ton, but there's always a couple positions open. They they're very conservative with the hiring, which has been awesome during layoff times. Um, and again, I've been there 23 years, so that says something about. Uh, how loyal they are to the their good employees. So that's Verisk. And then um, MTech, I teach two weeks a year, plus I sub when someone needs uh, help for the web development program here. Um, and yes, I have to say there's lots of seats up front. Sorry, but you're welcome to come up front. But uh, you're welcome to come and go. We're Right now, we're going to be doing introductions for the next 30 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the food's there. You, there's still food, so that's probably the most important thing. But um, yeah, um, and then stand up. What I'm working on, my my main job, I I do Angular uh, front end and C sharp back end, and I'm converting I'm converting an application from a Windows program to the web, so we can sunset uh, this old code that we have. And uh, it's going pretty well. Enjoy that a lot. I like doing full stack, and and I prefer front end over back end. The rest of my team, it's a database team, so they're they all love the back end and the database stuff. So, um, do, do you? 
Yeah, I with with Ionic, I, I did maintain uh, an Ionic PWA at Verisk for uh, many years after we had a couple of native apps and then switched to a PWA using Ionic. Um, but now I'm on a different team, database team. So uh, now I just use it on the side, play with it. And uh, uh, yeah, that's that's me and uh, start Wayne, right? Yeah, and we're just we're gonna go around, have everyone come up, stand in front of the camera. We're we're recording today, and like I said, do an introduction, and then yeah, we're gonna go across the back. Okay, uh, quick introduction. My name is Wayne Hansen. Um, I'm actually a student at M Tech. Um, so Todd actually introduced me to Ionic here a couple of months ago. Um, I'm currently doing contract work and finishing up my externship for the uh, program here at MTech. And then, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, doing contract work. Uh, I've actually got a contract right now that they might be asking me to take their current website and convert it into an Ionic website. So I thought this might be a fitting opportunity tonight. Um, and then I um, have also been working, doing a React project. Um, just got my first introduction this last couple of weeks to using Firebase Cloud Functions and struggling with understanding how to debug Firebase Cloud Functions. So that has been my top priority and been quite a struggle, but a good learning experience. So um, yeah, that's me. Um, I'm Corey MacArthur. I'm a front end, primarily front end developer. I actually also use Firebase, and you'll hear a lot more about me when I present a little later today. So I'll let somebody else take more time. I'm Ryan Gull. I live up in Heber, so I took the drive down the canyon. I am a, I lead a group of developers at an organization called the Dash Incubator. And we are a very informal group of developers that are working around the Dash cryptocurrency. So Dash was one of the, the first cryptocurrencies around. It's been over a decade now in you know, on the live network, um, five years after Bitcoin started. And uh, yeah, so we are building a web wallet right now um, using pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, so no frameworks at all. Um, and I'd like to make a mobile app out of that. So I did comment last month about, hey, can we show just... Um, just using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, wrap that in an Ionic wrapper. So thank you for uh, doing this topic. And if anybody's interested in working with me, uh, just ask me, talk to me sometime today, or you know, uh, send me in a, a message or something on the uh, on the meetup. And there's no like formal interview process to to work with me. It's just we pay out in cryptocurrency, and we pay basically like task-based work. So if you're interested in just getting started with some some stuff, we do have an actual, I, I, I do plan on using Ionic. So uh, if you're interested, let me know. Ooh. I'm Ben Callahan. I am, uh, I guess I'm a local now been in Lehigh for a while. I work for Edigy. We are a credit card processor. Our office is just up the road from here. I'm primarily a .NET developer. That's my day job. But whenever I have a personal project, I usually jump straight towards Ionic and Angular. One of my projects, Organ Stops, which I've presented on before in this meetup, just hit a new milestone. It exceeded the database bandwidth allowed by the Firebase free tier. <laughs> So now I have to deal with that. <laughs> Thanks. 
I'm Sam. Um, I work at Security Metrics as an IT infrastructure engineer or site reliability engineer. If you don't know what that is, it's DevOps adjacent. I used to do full stack web development, um, but I haven't been out of the space for five or six years. So just looking for some inspiration, seeing what's new and stuff. And so. Hello, my name is Julius, and um, I get the feeling that I'm not as experienced as the other people here. I've never been a professional developer, but I've been um, definitely uh, developing on my own for like maybe three years. And I've definitely uh, tried to get into the startup world many times, and it's like it's slowly kind of getting better. And I'm already going to start trying to uh, start something up, and I'm, I'm completely new to Utah. I just moved from uh, Europe, actually. So um, I'm definitely interested in seeing how Ionic maybe could be used to, to launch like a very simple um, like food type app. It's kind of the idea. Thank you. Uh, I'm Andrew Manwaring. I work, uh, I, I'm a full stack engineer at Wistic. Wistic does uh, vendor risk management. So if you want to assess whether the company you, you're uh, sharing your data with follows security standards, you might use Wistic to assess that. Um, I So I do Angular in the front end and Java in the back end. And I've, I've never used Ionic before, but um, sometimes when I have an idea, I, I've researched it a little bit. Uh, so I. Just wanted to come and find out more about it and see what other people were using it for. I'm here with Rocky, my service dog. My name is Sarah Danes. I am a DevOps engineer. I recently graduated, uh, finished launch school, which is a full stack online mastery-based learning course. And I was hired by Sphinx Defense as a DevOps engineer. Sphinx Defense builds communication devices with satellites. We facilitate that. And as a DevOps engineer, I'm updating things. I'm uh, mostly updating things. Sometimes I create some stuff, but mostly updating things. Uh, I'm currently learning Kubernetes because 2.0 of our software is going to be run in Kubernetes. So I spend a lot of time learning Kubernetes. In my free time, because I love coding, I have a couple of side projects. Uh, so some of my siblings, for example, my sister Emily, she sells art. She's a magnificent painter, and I'm working on a website for her to show that off. I also built a website for my brother-in-law who does DIY rings, which is you can build your own wedding bands, earrings, whatever, as a course. And my interest in Ionic is that I have a, an app that I would like to build out, and I've been working in React Native, and I'm wondering if this is another option. So, okay. I'm Josh Jenkins. I'm a data engineer at R1RCM, um, and I build data pipelines. I just recently had the privilege of transitioning from our big megalith pipeline that needs a ton of maintenance and, and work, and now I've got to build a little bit some smaller pipelines. So we've been working with Python and Databricks um, and leveraging a lot of the new features that Databricks has to offer, like Delta Live Tables and Autoloader and a bunch of other things. Um, had the privilege to build some pipelines from Jira, where we hit the Jira API, pull in all their data, um, run it through a pipeline, through a bronze, silver, gold medallion architecture. Um, and then we're also taking all of the Azure costs that R1 incurs with all of their resources um, and subscriptions through Azure so that we can get that data sorted and organized into to our gold tables. Um, so that our Power BI reports can read from them and we can then start predicting when predicting our costs and, and, and notifying our management groups when spikes happen so that we can stop them in their tracks. Um, 
Ya. Hello, Tim Ellenberger. Um, been here in the Valley for quite a few years now. Um, worked at various companies um, over the last 20 some years here. Um, in various roles from engineering to quality to site reliability, DevOps most recently. I'm currently working on some startup ideas um, and been working on a couple things. One of them in the space of home automation where you can have a control system that you talk to that doesn't have to connect to the internet. So you can actually have privacy and not have them knowing what you do and what, you know, what time of day you do things. And so working on that, um, currently really working on waiting for a chipset, some chipsets, some NXP and some other chipsets to come out later this year to move that forward. And then another one is uh, basically cloud solutions for small businesses. When you look at doctor's offices and lawyer's offices, they can't afford a whole IT staff. But a lot of them are actually not meeting compliance requirements. In a couple of years, there'll be a lot more legislation in that they have to. So working with a couple of individuals uh, trying to put together a turnkey solution and then provide a command center service that they can outsource to. Um, interest in Ionic, um, I've attended once before and played around with it. I'm uh, chatting with another startup right now looking for a CTO role. So their stuff, their prototype and everything, their initial products built with Ionic and Angular. So I thought I better get up to speed on it real quick before we get into discussions there further. Um, but, you know, as you're going out there, definitely go and pursue these little side projects and startups because I've just known a lot of people that it's just this passion that kind of leads to things that are great. So, all right, thanks. Yeah, keep it down. <laughs> Hi, I'm Makrand Karmarkar. I'm um, a front-end React developer. I um, haven't tried Ionic. I'm in this field for about eight years now and um, work for an um, insurance uh, company, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, but remote. <clears throat> Um, hi, uh, my name is Jared. Uh, I am a very much full-time student. <laughs> I go to BYU and also MTech in the mornings. Uh, I also have a full-time job, so I am very, very busy. I've been doing this for about four years now. Uh, I'm a senior. <laughs> um, I haven't really worked much on professional project. I have done a lot of projects of my own with React, uh, recently uh, got introduced to REST. And so I'm building an API using uh, with REST um, and MongoDB. So yeah, I'm actually looking for an opportunity to start kind of getting more into the grid of work. And, um, and this is my first time getting in contact with Ionic. So I'm actually excited to get to know people and learn more. So that's kind of my goal. <laughs> so my name is Alfie and I'm, I'm a, a mathematician who's been pretending to work as a software developer for for about 15 years now to uh, to be able to pay bills and um and basically if um, um my interest in i uh, in ionic is mostly curiosity i'm not 100 percent sure if i'd ever use it for a project but uh, i figure i'd rather uh, be familiar with it and not use it than, than i would be to uh, to not use it because i'm not i don't know what it does and or or, or for what, it, what other people are doing with it for that matter and um Currently, I'm working as a, a contractor for uh, for uh, a company called uh, Everybody Learning L LLC, and I'm trying to uh, to write an API for an app so that would uh, be able to be embedded into uh, learning management and management software. 
And I currently, I'm, uh, that's actually one of the things I'm really, really stuck on right now because for the past couple of weeks, I've been wondering, what, uh, I'm trying to figure out why um, why a demo app wouldn't uh, pass along its uh, LTIK key. And uh, um, um, and I think that uh, that's uh, pretty much it, uh, except for this is my son. I'm Matthew and I'm just here for the free food. <laughs> Okay, my name is Yulisa, and I'm a former student of MTech, specifically cohort 12. Um, definitely don't remember me, that's fine. <laughs> and um, I am not nearly as experienced as any of you, like at all. I am still currently working on my bachelor's. I'm in my last semester, um, but I am working on my senior capstone and that happens to be redesigning the ad drop system for, or basically the registration system for UVU. So that's kind of cool. We're using Vue.js for that. But other than that, I don't have a lot of experience with Ionic and I want to learn, so thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Al. I'm a web and app development student at UVU. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience with um, working outside of that, but I have picked up a few side projects while I've been there. I did um, design and develop a website for a um, queer activism group associated with BYU that's called Cougar Pride Center. Um, so I built their website and I work with the College of Engineering and Technology on campus with their marketing team and we're working on redesigning all of the UVU websites um, right now and hopefully they'll let me into development for that. So Hi, my name is Nicole. Um, I am a current student uh, here at MTech for web programming and development. Um, I'm also a student at UVU, just taking a little break and getting more foundational skills here. Um, I as well have worked with the College of Engineering, Engineering and Technology there with uh, the engineering department, um, rebuilding their website and just, just working on a few projects there. Hello, uh, my name is Ian Lenars. I'm here tonight to kind of get to know a little bit more about web development and creating apps and all that. I actually come back, uh, come from a data analytics role, and so I'm trying to get some experience. I'm just a student, uh, but I'm always open to new opportunities, so. Just want to get a little, know a little bit more. Thank you, guys. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, um, see a couple notes about some of the things that uh, you were all talking about. But I, I know, like for Sarah, uh, Brett Palmer, that is one of our co-hosts. He runs the DevOps Salt Lake City meetup, and uh, he couldn't be here tonight because he's got a, a meetup with, uh, with that group. We, we've been on Tuesdays for the longest time, and and uh, we we flipped this one probably by accident, um, but uh, here we are. And uh, um, let me see. Oh, I did want to just touch quickly on give you an overview of of Ionic. So yeah, let's let's do this real quick. This will just take a minute. So just to get a full picture of what Ionic is, um, I mean, you got to start from the top. High level summary. You know, they 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 do a great job of of uh, they call it DX. The developer experience is just fantastic. With uh, you can install their CLI, and they have a they have lots of tooling uh, built in with that. They have a plugin for VS Code that'll also do most of the stuff the CLI will do. And uh, 
<clears throat> but let's let's dive in here. So specifically, what is it? Because like like tonight, uh, Corey's I imagine going to focus mostly on capacitor. Does that sound right? <laughs> so that's one of the things where it's going to be in this list right here. So it's a CLI. So you do NPM install globally Ionic CLI, and that'll get that'll install it on your system, make it available so you can type Ionic start. And that creates a new project, and it'll ask you a bunch of questions because you can do an Ionic project with Angular, Vue, or React with their CLI. It's also fully packaged up and portable, and you can add it to any project that you already have going um, <clears throat> just by doing an NPM install into your project. And uh, so that, that's an option as well. Um, Let's see. So it's a CLI. You've installed that, but it's also a UI toolkit. They use Stencil, and that's down at the bottom. They use a, a product they make called Stencil JS to write a whole bunch of UI components. You know, it's the buttons and the, the headers and the, the menus and just every all, all of the components that you need um, to uh, to build your app. And and they're all mobile first. They're all in fact, like, let me see, I think it says here, yeah, second bullet point there, supports Android UI, which is called Material Design, Material U, I think is the latest version, and then Apple UI, which is the Apple Design Guidelines or something like that. And so it supports those. So when you, when you use their widgets, your app, if you, you, the same code, it, it detects what you're running on and it applies a few attributes and then the CSS displays what the one style or the other. So the same code base, if you load it, like if you, if you publish this on a website and they, people are going to it on their phones, on an iPhone, it's going to be Apple style, but same website on an Android phone, it's going to be material style. So that's some of the magic that they do. There's a whole bunch more where like, like navigate, uh, navigation animations, they follow the Android or Apple, depending on which one you are. And so when you're clicking diff page to page and things, it uh, it follows the guidelines of the platform they're on. <clears throat> that toolkit also includes a whole bunch of CSS helper classes like you get with most uh, CSS libraries uh, to help with uh, grids and um, alignments and flexbox and just all, all the things they have a bunch of classes really easy to use they have a theme generator so you can uh, just like if you've ever used angular material before they've got one too you take you can go to their website create your theme primary color secondary color danger color morning all, all those things and then um background colors and and then you take that copy it and just paste it into your project into the the uh the global CSS file, um, then dark mode supported out of the box. Especially if you if you spin it up with the Ionic CLI, you're going to get all of this just uh, for free. Okay, so it's a it's a CLI. It's a it's a UI toolkit. Third, it's it's an icon library. All of these are fully modular. Let me keep, I'm going to keep saying that you can take any project you're working on, and you're looking for an icon library to use, you can use that without any of the other Ionic pieces and parts. Everything's fully modular, open source, and ready to ready to use. Really nice icons. Capacitor. Now you take you take your Angular or or uh, React or Vue project, and and you code it up, and you're testing it in your web browser, and then you're like, okay, it's time. I want to put this in the App Store. Well, by default, if you've created it with the Ionic CLI, it includes the basic capacitor plugins. And then you just have to run a couple of commands to actually say, I mean, because some people only want Android or they only want iPhone. So it's fully up to you to run the commands to kick off that sub project of your app. And once you do that, the capacitor, you, you, you have a full Android project in a folder in your, in your code. Or if you're going the Apple route, you have a full Xcode iPhone project folder with, with everything in it that you need. 
And so you're always working from that top level project. And then you're, uh, as you work and make changes, you, you push your changes down into those other projects. But capacitor is the tool that lets you, it, it creates those projects for you, maintains them as you, as you go along, helps you keep them up to date, helps you compile and build them. And then a capacitor also is second bullet point there, easy access to the phone features with plugins. They have a ton of plugins. And uh, <clears throat> are you going to go much into plugins tonight or just mainly the, the, the wrapping, the yeah, packaging it up? So it's, it's, it's those two main things. It's the packager to make it an app. And it's a whole bunch of plugins that give you access to the person's contact list, you know, with all those permissions that you have to grant for an app. So it helps you configure all those and, and, and use them, access them in your app. Stencil.js, I mentioned that. You can use Stencil.js. Corey's used it to build projects with. Um, it outputs web components. If you read about web components, they're fully supported by the browser. Um, but that's what all of the, the UI toolkit is. Uh, all the components, you're, you're, you're pulling them into your project as web components created from Stencil.js. And then the last thing I'll mention, it's like Ionic does a whole bunch of stuff. How do they make money? They have something called AppFlow with a whole bunch of features in it from authentication helps to encryption helps to building in the cloud. You can, you can use them as your GitHub and push your project up and, and push build and it'll build. They have test, test runners to do in the cloud. They have uh, uh, just tons of services to help you. It, it, it's almost, it, um, it's a little bit costy, but you know, when you compare the price of AppFlow with hiring someone to take care of cloud builds or testing or you know all those kind of things all the management stuff it does it's it's a it's a great product and that's 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 their uh, paid tier is if you uh, sign up for appflow so anyways that's ionic and uh, let's let's take like a what three or four minute break and and then uh, we'll get Corey set up and yeah jump into his presentation any first of all um any any questions about ionic or the stuff we've talked about so far okay let's start from this side go left to right go ahead uh -huh. yeah Yeah. Um, I actually have a couple of thoughts on that too. Yeah. I don't have a presentation, but, but yeah, you can build with React, Angular, Vanilla JS, and Pasta is just going to wrap. So it's just there are different trade offs for each platform where you're going to go with React Native or Pasta. But yes, you can. Yeah. One, one of the big pros for using Ionic over React Native, because React Native is a great tool and a lot of great stuff built with it, um, is if, if you've got people in your team, that have web skills, then it natively, I mean, it simply, you can start building Ionic because you're building a web project and then you're gonna package it with, uh, with Capacitor, but you're still working in React JS. And uh, so um, it's, it's so, you know, cause React, React Native is, they have their own special components that get converted into native uh, widgets and stuff for the, for the apps. So it's just full in on web and, and, and also it, it lets you have, you know, all the targets, the web, iPhone, um, the, the Android, and you can even wrap it up with, uh, with Towery or, or these other tools and put it on Mac and Linux and Windows. But um, yeah, so that, that's that. Sarah, what did you have? Yeah, React Native or, yeah. Yeah, so look, Google it too, because there's been several papers that um, Ionic and some some of the developers will, uh, that use Ionic have, have published about that. Yeah. Okay, questions about bundle size using Ionic capacitor and all that. Um, yeah, so we, we talk a lot about bundle size, especially when you when you publish on the web. Right, because people are on their phones a lot. I mean, phones now, you know, outpaced computer access to websites. 
Um, so bundle size is, is very important on the web, not very important when you package up and put it in the app store. You know what I mean? You, they're inst you're installing an app and, and the size of the app is on par with other apps when you, when you go that route and wrap it with capacitor and, and put it in the app store. But the, uh, the, the web experience it pretty much uh, leans on the expertise of Angular, React, you know, and Vue with their build ecosystems to, to, to optimize it for uh, bundle size. So, you know, a lot of them are switching from Webpack to Vite to build, and uh, you get some great, great uh, bundle, low, small bundle sizes, and, and, and what do they call it? Uh, sectioning off your app and the different, different bundles. And, but uh, yeah, question back. Can you do Ionic with Svelte? If you Google that, you'll find a couple of people that are doing that. And uh, it's not officially supported by Ionic, but like I said, the, uh, the Ionic UI can be put in any web project. So you can put that in a Svelte project. But, but you know, we talked about what, six or seven different parts of Ionic, what, what all of it is. You can take a Svelte project and package it up with Capacitor, just kind of like what Corey's gonna do tonight. He's gonna talk about a regular website that he's going to package up with capacitor and the ionic capacitor that we mentioned. And so, so it can be used, uh, you know, you can just kind of pick, pick Svelte and pick capacitor and, and however you want to build that. But it does, yeah, it doesn't integrate super tightly with it out of the box. Anyways. Okay. Now, now let's take a four minute break and then Corey will start. Okay, now I do have some power. It's just a USB C. <clears throat> and then let me see about. You got the invitation. <laughs> yeah. Live behind the scenes here. Um, I've mostly done like so if you load up StreamYard, do you see the, the, uh, yeah, I'm trying to say Enter Studio. Yeah, Enter Studio. And I will. Yes. Okay, you all be, won't be able to hear us for a minute while, uh, while Corey connects and gets into StreamYard. All right, there you are. So go ahead and there's two things you got to do that have to be stage. Okay. That's my bed. Mute. Okay, I'm gonna draw. All right. Kian, you there? Can you actually hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Cool.
I just muted to make sure uh, you couldn't hear it. We'll come back in like two minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm probably going to jump in and out of this presentation, um, but I've liked the participation so far tonight, so feel free to raise your hands or interrupt if something doesn't make sense. Um, so for, I'm going to, here's a little outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, I'll give an introduction about me, really what is Capacitor JS. We kind of got a little overview of that. Um, how it's different from other hybrid app solutions, um, what it can do, and then some like getting started tips, like when you're writing your first web-based mobile application, and then also a demo of like creating a capacitor app and getting it running on a simulator. And I, the questions bolt shouldn't be on there. Hopefully we can just have questions throughout. So please don't wait before you throw up your hand and ask a question, because that helps me. Um, my background uh, is actually mostly self-taught developer, YouTube taught. So um, I appreciate a lot of people that introduced today say, hey, I don't know a lot, but that it just takes little by little. In fact, a lot of people that introduced themselves went over my head <laughs> when you start talking DevOps and different backend softwares. Um, I'm, I'm primarily a front-end developer, and I use services like Firebase for all of my backends because um, I prefer to do just JavaScript. I am the founder of One Goal Finance. We're a, an iOS, Android, and web application that helps couples stay on the same page with their with their finances. It is built in Capacitor JS, um, Ionic web components, and then Stencil JS is kind of the framework of choice. Even though Stencil is not a framework. Uh, previous to this, I was at Table Needs. I worked as, as a small startup, so I was part of their VP of product, but also coding and also designing. So, kind of jack of all trades, master of none. Um, we are an Ionic React shop. So someone mentioned earlier, can you do React with Capacitor? Yes, this was a React application. Their backend was, um, I believe it was Rails. And our application that we shipped was just an iOS application for restaurants. So the restaurants would get an iPad and their app would be installed natively, but all of our code changes could go through, um, through our web updates, right? Because we're writing HTML, CSS, JavaScript. I'm also the co-founder of an app called Our Tributes, and I'll show a little demo of what that is, but it's just web only. So it also uses Ionic Capacitor and Stencil JS, but we don't have a native app. We don't have a need for a native app. So it's just a progressive web app. So mostly just on the web. 
Um, before I worked at Table Needs, I worked for a company called Swerkit, where we rewrote their, I think it was jQuery mobile at first, and then it was a Cordova hybrid application. And then we rewrote it when I joined to Capacitor.js, just as Capacitor launched, like in, I want to say like 2016 or 2017. But Swerk, it's a really interesting case for Ionic. If you've seen their, if you look through their docs, you'll see a couple of like um, case studies with Swerk it because Swerk it is an application that's used by 500,000 plus monthly active users. They were on Shark Tank in 2015, shook hands with Mark Cuban, with a, made a deal with him that didn't go through after. But anytime Shark Tank airs, it gets, we get a bunch more um, downloads and subscribers. And I think the, the coolest thing for me at Swerkit is that regularly, in fact, they just got requested again, I'm, I'm still in contact with the CEO, to be featured by Apple. So a lot of people think that if you're building a hybrid application, Apple's going to frown upon that because they want you to build in Swift. And the, the root of it is you build a good app that customers love and they, they can pay for it through the App Store, Apple will still feature you. So it's not just native apps. Purely native, I should say, because Swerkit is a native application, but most of the code is is WebView. And then my, one of my first projects I built was uh, this Phases score, scorecard. It was my father-in-law's fun card game for families, and we needed a way to help people keep score. So I built this as just an Angular app that was Cordova. We pulled it off the App Store, but you can still access it on the web. So I built a, a bunch of things with Ionic and obviously a big Ionic fanboy. So ask me any questions. So what is Capacitor.js? So we, we talked a little bit about it already, but it's an open source native solution that helps you write in web code and then ship that web code through a native wrapper. So if you are starting out and you already have a, a website, you already have a web application, great. Uh, Capacitor is going to wrap it. If you want to primarily write most of your code, in web technologies, great capacitor can wrap that and give you access to native layers. Um, and so for existing projects and creating new projects, I still choose capacitor because I like writing in the technologies I know, and I can ship to iOS, Android, web, all with one code base. And it allows lots of engineers that normally wouldn't write native applications to build great, great applications. Um, so here's what's kind of on the market today for, well, there's probably even more than this, but these are the, the primary winners, I'd say, in the space. Cordova is kind of being phased out, but Cordova was one of the, one of the first ones that you'd write in web technology. You would then build the native files from these web config files. So like you'd have to run some command line that would take your web code and then compile it into a native code. And the native files, most of the time, weren't actually committed in your GitHub resource. Like you just have your web files and your config files, and then you'd build it and ship it. This presented a lot of problems, even at Swerkit when I first joined when it was on Cordova. We ended up committing a lot of our native files because as soon as you tried to build on someone else's machine, like you'd, you'd run into problems. So we started committing it so that you wouldn't have that problem as, you, as your team grew. Um, and then Cordova, there's lots of issues with, with Cordova nowadays, but I won't spend too much time bashing on them. <laughs> but Capacitor is a direct replacement for Cordova. In fact, you can use a lot of Cordova plugins in Capacitor because it is very similar technology. Flutter is, is its own kind of language, right? You're, when you write an app in Flutter, it's going to compile to native iOS, compile to native Android, and it's going to compile to web. Um, it's going to compile to web code that is available, but there's some web is kind of a, a second class citizen. It's native first, or I guess native second, Flutter first, then compiles into native, and then web is their afterthought. So even the first versions of Flutter, they were shipping your website on, on a canvas. I've even seen apps in the last year that when you went to their website, you were looking at a canvas element. So if you tried to inspect the, the HTML, it was just a, canvas, a single canvas element, and on the canvas was rendered all of your UI which makes it very hard for accessibility, like it's virtually not accessible. No one can, no one can access or, or click it without having a, if they were you know, uh, sight impaired or something like that. And it's very hard to debug on the web when you're just rendering to Canvas. So you put a lot of trust on Flutter. I think they're getting a lot better um, than that first version, 
but still web is there is kind of second class to what flutter is building primarily for native ios and android and there's a lot of flutter plugins out there um google is did they acquire them or did it was flutter a google project i can't remember but either way it's google backed like it's a it's a product you can trust up trust in and i just bumped something oh um, it's a product you can trust and but the the methodology is different right you're not if you know web code you still have to learn how to build something in Flutter. Uh, React Native, which was mentioned earlier, uh, has some great React-like paradigms, right? You're, you do do React-like things, like you can do React stores and handle data that way. However, you can't just use like normal divs or DOM elements like you would in React Web, because you have to use specific React Native elements. So yes, it's it, it follows some paradigms of React, but it's not like you can just write any React code and then ship it to React Native because you have to use React Native elements, if that makes sense. So even if you are a React developer, you still have to learn the React Native like paradigms, where the benefit of using a capacitor is that you can code your web, your website in any framework or no, no framework that you, if you don't want to use a framework, and it can still just be wrapped in capacitor and shipped to a capacitor app without having to do any kind of conversion to capacitor code because there's no conversion. Um, capacitor gives you late, like they had there's in fact, I think that's my next, next slide. Capacitor, yeah. So capacitor, other things that capacitor can do besides just wrap your, your website is that there's tons of plugins that are natively supported, like backed by the Ionic team, basically primary function um, applications like, or plugins like taking a picture, um, take, doing push notifications, file storage, like device information if you're trying to find unique identifiers, um, sharing. So if you're on a native device and you hit the share API, it'll pull up the native action sheet for sharing. We're on, on a web, depends on the, the uh, actually I think all web browsers have a native share API now as well. That'll pop open and let you share to other applications. And then geolocation and a lot more. And then on top of all those, there's also community plugins like Firebase, barcode scanning, face detection, app icon. If you're a, if you're a Firebase user, like they'll have there's some nice Firebase plugins for that. If you use a there's also third party plugins for taking purchases. I use one called we've used Revenue Cat in the past, which was Cordova, and I used a new one called Glassify or Glassby that was built off of capacitor. So like that was the main reason I even chose them just because I knew it would be an easy drop in solution. And if you've ever built native purchase, if you ever had to build native purchases on an iOS device, it's rough, but they made it really easy with that plugin. So you can do a lot of things on a native, on, on the native layer through a capacitor plugin. Uh, that being said, things that you can't do, or I, I wouldn't recommend is like, if you're building a highly graphic intensive you know, application, you're not going to get the performance that you would if you're playing like Need for Speed, right? You wouldn't play Need for Speed on a native on a on a web browser. So um, that's why they go directly to those uh, those core libraries when you're building highly 3D graphical interfaces and things like that. But if you do have a game that works on the web really well, you can still port it over to a capacitor app and will also still work really well. Any questions about that so far? what it can and can do. Um, OK, so I have a few little tips for getting started and building a PWA. Um, so for me, I always like going web first, and I like shipping things quickly. And even, even the first version of One Goal Finance is just a web application. So I'd send all my customers just go to our website. Um, in fact, you would, I'll show you this really quick. I would go to a new tab, and I'd tell them just go to app app dot come on take it out here app dot one goal finance dot com before we had the native app available you'd come here and if you hit the little share icon and you scroll down um, if your app is a a progressive web app and it has a couple files on it like a manifest json and a few other little things then they'll be able to save that application to their home screen so it actually feels a lot like a native application and then when you launch it, it actually launches in its own separate UI. Um, the beauty of this is that now you're looking at it and you have, you, you can still, it still feels like a native application, right? But it is still hitting the, 
or the requests are still going through the, the, the browser. Um, it can be a little slower than a native app, obviously, because all the, all the files aren't actually stored on the device. But progressive web apps do let you cache a lot of those responses. So you can make a progressive web app pretty fast. Um, the reason I pull that up is because if you can ship something to the web, you can iterate quickly. Um, it, it sounded like most of us here are web developers. You can ship a lot quicker without having to go through an app store to get approval. Yeah. I thought Apple didn't allow that. Is that a new thing you can do? Apple, I think, was the first one to actually create progressive web apps um, before anyone else. Yeah, that's been around for years. Yeah. The thing that's new on Apple that got announced uh, within the last six months is you can now do push notifications to a progressive web app, yeah. which you couldn't do before. In fact, the main reason I even went from one Go Finance as a as a web application to native was just for push notifications. Like that was the only native feature that I really needed. Um, and then once I built it, I was like, oh man, this is actually a lot a lot faster um, to launch and load uh, for a couple reasons. But the main reason is that if you're serving a web application or serving a website, you have to pass all of the DOM elements as, and then once the DOM hits the brow, the client, then it'll fetch like an API request to get your data and then your DOM will update with that data. Where if you have it on the native device, all the DOM's already there, right? So storing it, it's pulling it from the local, just like you're, when you're developing localhost, it'll launch that fast on your native app and all you have to do is fetch data to your database. So it's a lot faster when you have a native application because all the resources are on the device. The only thing that's coming from the server or should be coming from the server is, is data related. Um, so I always recommend going to a progressive web app first because then you'll, you'll have built what you need to actually put into your capacitor shell. On Apple's website, this is a webkit.org actually, but they have a really good, really good outline of like practices you can follow when building a progressive web app. So I just wanted to show a couple of these. And if you look at, you know, this is the, this is what the application would look like or a website would look like if you just launched it without any special CSS. Notice, you know, we get part of our website cut off because our, our website's filling the full width, but because of Apple's little notch, right? We, we're, we're getting scrunched there. And then as well as this little, uh, I don't know what you call this, little swipe up part on an iPhone device. Um, it still also covers up these little buttons across the footer. So they have something that lets you, they call it this, the safe area. So you want to design within these safe areas and then you can actually access them in your CSS so you can push your content in. Now, like the cheap way to do that is just to like push your, push your website in, put the, put the padding on the body or margin on the body using those, those elements. But really the right way to do it, the iOS way to do it is to like let your header and footer bleed all the way across and then your content can get squished inside. And you'll notice when you rotate the device, where would be one that has that, did I log in here? When you rotate the device, um, this one you can see like the sign in button is, isn't, you know, squished off that rounded corner like it would be on a website. Um, so it's respecting those, those uh, safe areas. And this one, you can tell I can still swipe up from the bottom and that, that button looks like it's in the appropriate position where in that first, that first one, it'd be, if I didn't do that correctly, like it would be pushing off um, right over that, that gesture, gesture point. So that's kind of the main CSS changes you'd want to do if you're trying to wrap your website or web app into Capacitor. But even before going to Capacitor, I recommend doing that so that you can ship your progressive web app and it feels like a native app without even having to go do it all the way native. And here's what those look like. It's just env parenthesis safe dash area dash inset left, right, bottom. They even have a top one so that when it rotates up, you can do the same thing. Push your, push your header down a little bit. Um, alrighty, so now we're going to jump right into uh, the demo, and this might be a little boring, but I actually kind of like it because the docs are really good when it comes to Ionic. So I'm literally going to their capacitorjs.com website, and they'll give you steps on how to get started. Like right here on the landing page, you can see there's three steps. Um, so if you want to drop it into an existing website, you're going to install Capacitor, and then you can initialize it. If you're trying to add something, create a new project. Um, you can, is it not here? I oh, know it's this right here. It is this. 
this is, I don't know why they said this is existing. This is a new one. So I'm actually going to do a new project right now. Not the, not the demo I did the other day. Do I need to zoom in? Can you guys see this? Back row, can you guys see that? Um, so you'll see the first uh, the first line here is they're, they're going to ask us to install a couple things. Um, I'm actually just going to run npx cap init because I want to create everything. And it will not work. Of course not. I didn't write down the first step, apparently. Maybe I just need to click this button. There we go. Sorry. It's npm init capacitor app. There we go. Create a new capacitor app. So if I run this script, npm init capacitor app, then it'll ask me a few things. And this is like all I have installed is um, node, right, and npm. And it's it's going to run through a couple of things just to create this application. So I'm going to call this demo app. And we're going to put it in this same directory. We'll call it demo app. If you're actually shipping to the app store, you'll actually have to get like a native um, app ID. But for now, I can make this up. And example.app. And now you can see, I'll show you what it looks like. If I go to my documents, I had this cap demo folder and I created this my app folder. And really, it comes with a couple things out of the box. That's the one I did before. Demo app, sorry, thank you. So this demo app, let me pull that into VS Code. Yes. So now that I pull this into VS Code, we're gonna install some things. But in the package JSON, it's it's got my name, right? Capacitor app, random description, keywords, and it's got capacitor core, capacitor camera. Looks like we already have a, a plugin in there for you and splash screen. And then really the only like files we have in here is an index file. It's awesome capacitor app. There are some interesting things here that worth noting, like the meta file, the meta viewport tag has a some content settings, like it's gonna cover the whole width and height. It also is not gonna let you scale, which is a little counterintuitive because People like, at least in the olden days, you'd go to Safari and if you couldn't read something, you'd pinch and zoom to scale it. And this is going to prevent that from happening. And we're doing that on purpose because on a native device, like your pinch and zoom should only work if your if your app supports this pinch and zoom gesture to do something specific. Um, so that's that's expected. Uh, we're loading some PWA elements, but we could actually pull this out. Like I'm actually going to pull this out so it's a little more vanilla. I'm going to pull out this PWA elements as well. There's the manifest JSON in here that is what you need to make it a progressive web app. So it includes your name, like what you want to have it show up on the home screen when you save to home screen. So let's actually just change this just so that you guys, we can all see this, um, where it's going to drop you off when you first land there. There's a couple settings you can make how you want it to display when it's a progressive web app. And then it'll load the style sheet. And doesn't even look like oh they 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 do have a web component but we're gonna we're gonna pull this off right because we're just doing this we're just doing this as a vanilla project so there we go I'm gonna put Ionis Meetup on here hey there <clears throat> so very basic all we have is this index file in the source um, and if I were to um, serve this up. Let's just try this out. npx serve. You'll see in my source. Oh, it's because I don't have a, I don't have any compile steps. So it's actually serving to this source um, file here. And what I ought to do is serve it from a specific folder. Um, so all, all we have is a website right now. Okay. And I can serve it there if I want to look at it, make sure it's working. But now our next step with Capacitor is you're going to add a platform. So for us, I'm, I'm on an, an 
Apple device, so I'm actually going to add iOS. In fact, let's go back to our docs so that we can see this. Um, not the starting one. So I already have, here's my existing project, just because. Um, we already have it installed, so really our next step is right here. Install the native platform you want to target. So I need to first install Capacitor iOS. Let's just verify it's not on there. I don't think it is. Yeah, because it's it's a PWA first, so I don't actually have to add capacitor slash iOS if I don't if I don't want to actually launch it on a native device. So I'm going to install just this one, capacitor iOS, and then that next step for us is we're going to add iOS, npx cap add iOS, and then once we've added iOS, we can then actually ship or actually preview it on an iOS device. So there we've added the platform of iOS and you'd see we got a new folder here. The only difference in this is now we have this new folder iOS and then our capacitor. Oh, this would have been here already. Yeah. So the only difference is we added this iOS um, folder and it'll include our Xcode project files and other Swift files. Um, I didn't mention this before I was talking about it with, with Cordova, but Cordova, you would, you weren't supposed to commit your native files because Cordova was going to handle the build for you. In Capacitor, it's different. It, their plugins are built on the native layer, and you can write your own native layer code if you'd like to. So all of your native code gets committed. Um, your web code, your source file will get com committed, right? But you can also have your dist like post build that won't get committed, just like you would in a normal website. But everything inside this iOS folder will be committed to get so that you can make changes to the native layer and expect it to function like you would on any um, any device or any computer that's going to run this. So inside this folder is an app. And then that's basically it. Um, for the sake of um, for the sake of just being trying to be as vanilla as possible, what I'm going to do is just create a new folder. If you have a build step, you just like put it into this dist folder. And that's just because inside of our capacitor config, it is looking for this web directory of dist. So I can write all my code and then I'll compile it and it'll put it into this dist folder. And that's what's going to be copied over into your, your native app. So for because we didn't have a build step, you just put dot. If you didn't have a build step, uh, you could put dot. I, I would probably still encourage you to just like copy folders over into a dist, the dist folder. Um, that way, it's separate. Um, yeah, but for me, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna drag and drop this stuff, index assets, all the way over. I probably don't even need it at all. But it's just CSS, JS. In fact, we don't even need that. So it's really the only thing I have in here is the CSS that's loading. We don't even have the logo on the page, so I don't need that either. So yeah, really all I need is that index file and that CSS file, and this will work. So now that I have a dist folder, so whether that happens in your build step or you just copy it over, um, your next step is to, you're gonna sync everything that's in your dist folder into your iOS project, and that's just a simple npx cap sync iOS. <clears throat> and it's basically taking everything that's in this disk folder and it's copying it over to this iOS folder. In fact, let's see if I can find it. It's under app public. So basically everything, this is copying it all now and it's also installing any kind of native plugins you have. So now this awesome capacitor app is the same as this one. But that sync is also syncing any native plugins that you have installed. So if you have, if you want to access like the, the camera, then you'd sync that camera plugin over as well. If you want to access um, your native native layer of device information, that sync would also handle that. So you can see, it just even it's in the logs, right? We're installing, it's running pod install in the background. Again, native layer code. And so now I can open it, MDX cap open iOS. Sorry, I should have launched the Xcode before getting up here. And here's my app that's open. If I 
open up this folder. Here's this public folder. That's where capacitor is loading everything. You can see that same code that's right there. <clears throat> and then I have this, this simulator open. So if I want to run it, I'm going to run it from Xcode because we are running a native project here. And it'll sync over after it's done building. This one I might need to zoom, huh? I don't know if you can zoom the Chrome in Xcode. So there we go. I didn't follow my own advice. So you can tell that my my header content isn't there or my, my spacing isn't correct there. And if I scroll it this way, same thing. It's going to be pushing to the far left or the far right. So really, that's, <clears throat> that's all there really is to it. Um, our web app is built. We've synced it with our native project, and we've put it into, um, into that native side. So right now, you could, you could create an app and submit it to the app store. Yeah, so so if I wanted to actually submit that app to the App Store, it's just you know you're going to archive. Um, oh, I got to change the build, but yeah, you'd you'd archive it. There's a couple steps, and then you'd upload that archive to the App Store, and then submit it for Apple's approval. There's lots of like Apple stuff you got to do before that, but to get it on your native device here, it's pretty pretty slick to do that that quickly in Capacitor. Any questions about with that so far? Yeah. So you can change in your iOS and your public folder, you can change this index file and it'll change how it appears. Yeah, you, you could. Um, hey there, this is updated. Um, and then I'd rebuild this thing. I'd have to stop it first. Then I'd rebuild. Oh, it's because I pulled it off the simulator, didn't I? I'd have to go back to iPhone 14 and then build it. But again, this folder, yeah, so there's my text. But this folder is, is part of the git ignore. So like, you wouldn't want to change it here because your web project is separate from your native project. And that's why that npx cap sync copies the files over. Yeah. And that's, that's a little more obvious when you actually add it to your git. So like, let's actually show what that would look like. So if I, this is it, right? If I pull this into GitHub. We are going to create this repository. Yes. Um, you'll notice the initial commit only includes, this is because Ionic gave us a lot of starter files with the gitignore, um, but it's the manifest JSON, everything inside my source file, package JSON. So there's my iOS files, but it does not include that public folder, right? So if I make any changes, I'd want to make those changes. And it doesn't include the disk folder either, right? So if I make any changes to my project, I would do that in my source folder. And that would show up in my, my git changes, right? So your web project can be all managed here. And as you ship it, it can update your, your website. In fact, <clears throat> I kind of skipped a few demos, but I think it, it's. Yeah, it's in. It's, so when you launch the app, it is inside a, a browser. In fact, that's kind of a nice thing when you're debugging because if you open up Safari, I can open up um, the simulator localhost and I can see if there's any you know errors running here, and debug it that way. Um, I was gonna. I I didn't pull these demos up, but here's here's like an example of our tributes, our app that is. It's a using capacitor, but just for like the native, um, the native layer, the native browser APIs. So for us, we use the little share API. So when I click on share, it actually pulls up Safari's little share thing, and I can share this to notes. I can share it to a person. Um, in this is the other cool one I want to show you. If I'm in Swerkit, this is our, this is the web browser uh, version of Swerkit, which is the same code base as our native layer. Um, in fact, when I first joined Swerkit, they had an Angular, I think it was Angular JS actually, was it? They had a separate code base for their, their web app, a separate code base for their hybrid native app, and then an Apple TV app. So, 
and there's only like four developers. Actually, when I joined, there was three developers on the team. No, I guess there was four. Um, so when we rewrote it, we rewrote it to combine our website and our native app so that anytime we updated the native app, it updated on iOS, Android, and web because they're all sharing the same code base. And so our, our process was make an update on the web. We'd then submit it to Apple. Once Apple approved, we'd like merge into main and then it would build, deploy on the web and we'd deploy on iOS and, and Android. Yeah. So it no. So Stencil JS is building web components. So web components are just for web the website, right? Capacitor is what gives you the native layer, right? So it's it's wrapping it in a native wrapper, right? So it is showing a web a web view, but you still with Capacitor can have access to native functionality like like your native camera or your native geolocation, because um, you can't get like native camera or native geolocation. Well, I guess both of those you can get on the web now. Um, give me the, yeah, there's, yeah, there's different, it's a little, di it's a little different if you're coming from the web, but like, here's an example of so this guy. So here's something that was fun for us to build. Like this is using the native capacitor app. Like you can using their, the camera API, we were able to like pipe in this live feed and people can do workouts with a real trainer while following the the native or following our platform, right? Um, so there's a lot of cool things you do with web. Um, this is our our finance application, right? It looks like this on a desktop, but on a native app, or actually on the web, because on the I don't have it there, do I? I have it here. Open, I'm not signed in, but on the on the native app, I could just do this it's going to just shrink down and be small, right? So because I built it responsive for web, it's also responsive for native. So it works on an iPad or works on a larger screen. Um, did I have another one? I think that was it. Yeah. So that was kind of our, that was kind of the main, um, the main thing I wanted to show, but any, any other questions about launching your first native app wrapped in capacitor? Okay, that's my demo. Um, thanks. This is fun. Oh, you got another one? <laughs> yeah, another question? So, yeah, normally if you have a build step, you're just going to build to the disk folder, right? And the only difference for Android, and we could do that here too. So I can say npx cap add Android, okay. Um, oh, you're right, NPMI, Ionic, uh, capacitor, sorry, capacitor, Android. So I'm gonna install that first, and then I'm gonna NPX cap add Android. And similar, I'm gonna get a new folder called Android. It's gonna have Gradle files and all that fun stuff. And then I can do the same thing, npx cap open Android. And because I'm because I'm doing a pure vanilla JS, um, I don't have live reloading set up. But in fact, maybe I should just show you this. Let me show you kind of once your project's built out, um, if you guys are still interested. Sorry, I'm going long. But here's like my one goal finance application. So if I'm going to start this project, it's going to live reload, live serve. Um, everything here is going to go to like a www folder. That's how my disk folder is. So in my capacitor config, its web directory is www instead of dist. So you can change what that is. So I'm actually curious if the, the dot will work in your case. Um, but that would be assuming your, your project is at the root, right? And then once I'm there, I can still serve this up here and debug it on a on the browser, right? Um, I can also in my capacitor config, if I change the the URL to localhost, then I can have live reload reloading on my native device 
while I'm debugging. So you hit a final save with him. Uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here, this is this other project, not just my simple demo, right? And I'm going to pull this up in the iOS 14 simulator. This one, I've got a couple more native plugins, apparently. That's why it's taking a little longer. Yes. <laughs> oh, Android Studio is open, too. Yeah. Sorry. Let's quit out of that guy. Hogging my memories. So where did that go? My simulator. So here's this native application. And if I want to change like something in here, Let's just change my envelope budgeting header. Tabs, tabs. Oh, no, it's not here. It is. Oh, it is on that one. Sorry, sorry. It is on this one. It's right here. I want to change this. We're translated, so you know my live reload will update here, but I can also have it update. You know, I can be checking across multiple instances if I want, right? There's Corey there. And my live reload not working here. You love it. Oh, this is not this is not the is not the one you're looking for. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm on the wrong page. This one is apparently feature flagged on this one. So ion title here. There we go. So there's Corey, there's Corey. And I can be debugging on both web and Android at the same time. Or sorry, web and native. And my live reload works across both browsers. Now I don't normally live reload and test on native and iOS or end web at the same time. I do most of my development in the web, and then I sync it to native, test it on native, and then upload and ship to iOS and Android. What's the most annoying part of working with Ionic or Capacitor? <sighs> the most annoying part. Um, so finding, I don't know, finding the right plugin that does what you want it to. I'm not a native developer. So if you have the native skills or native skills on your team, like you could write anything you wanted to, um, for me, like the latest one I was thinking of was, was native purchases. But once I found the right plugin that did it in like a promised based way that I wanted it to, like it was, it was easy. Um, but there's just like finding the right NPM package. You got to find the right capacitor package that that does what you want it to do. And that might be a more reflection of my skill set, right? Web web stuff versus native. I don't know. Do, does anybody else have experience with capacitor? I'm trying to think. Might have to, I might have to get back to you on that one too. What else? What else bothers me about capacitor? So those web components, are those mostly just containers for native styles, or is there functionality built into those? I see on your, your actual One Finance app that it's just web components all the way, rather than a lot of, I didn't see any HTML, just normal HTML divs and stuff like that. But. Um, so there, yeah, these, these are Ionic web components, right? So the beauty of this is now branching from capacitor strength to the Ionic framework UI components. But the reason I like using Ionic UI components wherever I can is because, for example, if I am, um, 
if I'm on an iOS device, I'm trying to think of a very specific one. Um, on this page, I my segmented control looks like this right on the top. This is the one that's the most obvious. But if I'm on Android, which is my Chrome is like a material design, right? My segmented control is going to look like this. And so as a I, I actually started out in design and then got into development. But as a designer, I love the idea of meeting your customer where they're at. So if you're on an Android device, like make them feel at home on an Android device. We don't need to redesign every UI component. Obviously we have custom components here as well, but make the, the UI look like they're, uh, like they're at home, like they're on an Android device. So that's one of them. Um, these, these are obviously custom components, these little transaction cards in, if you're looking at like the list item elements those look a little different on ios versus android it's not it's not hugely different um you'll notice the menu oops the menu on ios and android is a little different so this one's going to slide over the top um it's going to have different animation patterns if i'm oh there you go uh, transitions is the biggest one if i'm moving from you know restaurants and i'm looking at a new page notice on on material design it slides up from the bottom Right, so anytime you're on an Android, who who has an Android device here? Do I need to preach to the choir? So you guys know when you navigate to a new page, it slides up from the bottom every time. On iOS, it doesn't do that. It goes from um, right to left, like it it pushes to the pushes a something to the onto the stack. So if I'm on a page like this, and I click on a guy like this, it's going to slide in from the right, and that's an that's an iOS pattern, not an Android pattern. But when I launch a modal, right, here's my modal. This is still web components. Um, and you still get some really nice animations, right? Like Ionic has these drag drag um, interactions that still feel very native, even though this is web. Where on Android, if I look at this, um, it's just going to slide up from the top. It's going to be a little more square. The, the design patterns are different. You'll notice my save buttons, iOS, primary buttons in the top right, cancel buttons in the top left. Android, they're both in the top right and left. Your secondary buttons right there. Same code base. I didn't do any if else logic here. This is this is Ionic doing the, the, the pattern for you. And I can debug this too on web. Like if I wanted to look at this for iOS, I can just, you know, make this an iPhone SE. I'll refresh it. And I can still see those same um, Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to edit edit the category. I can still see those same animations in the web. It just detects what platform you're on and will apply the correct styles. There's a question online. Um, it says, uh, can you show making an API call? We don't have time for that. Can you just touch on what you do in the facts that are to make an API call? Yeah, so making API calls are just like you would on the web anywhere else. So um, in your framework of choice, you typically do it like on mount right? It's then going to fetch and get the data and then return it. Um, trying to think of a, an example that I, I use I here. The, but. I heard that when you install the capacitor HTTP plugin, mm -hmm. that you don't have to change your code. It actually like knows where your fetches or your Axios calls are. And it's I haven't ha I haven't them. I haven't even had to use the HTTP plugin. You I just use, I just use Firebase. Yeah. So I don't do really restful calls. I just do Firebase Cloud Functions or Firebase, you know, okay. JavaScript interactions. So you can either just do them like you normally do yeah. them, or if you have troubles and you need more controls over, uh, I don't know, plugin gives you options. You can configure mm -hmm. yeah, all the things on the call. But, but uh, yes, yeah, so you might need the plugin, but, yeah. but you don't have to have it. Yeah, and there are cases where you do add your own like if else logic. For example, um, we'll hide a button if I'm not on um, if I'm not on native. So if I go to my settings notifications, um, I only have my email notifications, but my push notifications because I haven't built it out for web. I just said, oh, if I'm on web, I'm just going to hide it. Um, but if I'm on native, uh, it'll show this new this new toggle. Right, I can turn on push notifications. And push notifications don't work in a in a development environment, so that's why that didn't show up. Yeah, there you have it. Can you 
flow? So we did at table needs. So when you have a team, it is so awesome because you don't have to worry about building on your um, on your machine. I'll do that to debug, but anytime I commit to app flow, it will, I can trigger a build or you can have it trigger build automatically and submit it to, I mean, it won't submit it to the app store, but it'll upload it to the Apple interface. And then you can submit it to the app store there. So the build can all be in your, in your, uh, your pipeline, your CI pipeline, rather than having to do it manually yourself. It's just like, I think their minimum is like 500 a month or something for um, capacitor app flow, which is a little more expensive if you're running your own dev project. But if you consider that versus, you know, a couple hours of your time or an, an extra developer that's just managing your, your builds and stuff, it's, it's worth it. It's very good.